katoa. Welcome as you're joining. Um, I'm Connor Twyford and uh, we're just getting people into the space. Um, I'll talk about recording in a moment, um, but as, we're, as you're all piling in, feel free to put your names and locations in the chat. And at this point, I'm going to stop and hand over to the wonderful Tuhiao Emily Bailey to open us with a karakia. Kia ora. Tēnā koutou katoa i tēnei pō, um, te pō whiro, um, te pō tuatai o Haratua. Um, I am me, Harota Kitty, to Tokoma or Koto Tinepo. Um, Roy here, um, he cut up a he cut up a noite lady to, um, to Fafoy more tire or to Fafoy Munga, now Tangata Kato, a Makiana, a Pakata, and a hockey, not Tangata Kato. Um, but yeah, welcome everyone. I was just gonna um, start us off with our karakia, but um, a huge mahi to everyone for joining us tonight. It's really lovely to see um, the turnout. Um, yeah, I'll um, to go to karakia and kahua to kia koutou. Uh, he kore, he kore, he pō, he pō, he ao, he ao. Tākari mai te ata, kore hi te manu, tēnō ao te, ka ao, ka ao, ka ao te ti hei, mauri ora. Mauri ora. Um, and thank you. And um, Emily and Oros are juggling the children tonight. So Oros is one of our fabulous tech team. So we're going to lose him in a due course. But um, it's always good to see your one beautiful face. Um, and thank you for opening us so gracefully. Um, tēnā koutou kua hui hui mai nei e mihi ana ki ngā mana whenua e ngā hoa mā tēnā koutou. Ko kona twaifa tōku ingoa and along with... To Hiao and Jason and our awesome tech team. Jason's my other co facilitator. We welcome you. I want to acknowledge the mana whenua of this land and to acknowledge also this, that this land was never ceded. Mana whenua and tangata Māori continue to hold sovereignty. Some brief housekeeping before we get started in earnest on this kaupapa. Our security, as you all have noticed, this event is being live streamed and recorded. Um, if you're uncomfortable being recorded, um, you can turn off your camera. Um, this will also be put on Facebook and uploaded to YouTube afterwards. Uh, in terms of safety, we practice the safer spaces policy. So um, in essence, that means that we ask that you please be respectful of your own and others' presence on this Zoom. And remember that this is your place to participate as well and also to allow others to do so safely. Uh, this hui tonight is one of a series of webinars being hosted by Rise Up for Climate Justice. We are a coalition of climate justice groups from around the country working together to centre social justice, tiriti justice at the forefront of our mahi. Uh, with the pandemic, we've moved online and we're holding a series of webinars on the first of each month to connect, educate and inspire action. So the theme of this quarter or this May Day evening is, uh, as Emily said, a huge one. Climate Justice, Indigenous Self-Determination and International Workers' Day. Capitalism is a common enemy of unionists, climate justice and Indigenous rights advocates. Yet at times, these three, three uh, rupu, if you like, have been openly critical of each other. So how do we, these movements, reconcile? What do we share? And how best can we support each other's work to press for the transformative climate and social justice we need? Uh, we'll be introducing each speaker more fully. Jason's going to do that uh, in due course. But for now, I'd like to just list our awesome speakers. Um, we have the wonderful Brooke Powell Stanley from Auckland Action Against Poverty. We have with us Paddy Gibson, um, climate activist, socialist, researcher with Jambana from Australia, or as he likes to say, he's an un-Australian. Um, and uh, Janice Panoho hopefully will be joining us. She's the kai, kai hautu Māori at the Public Service Association. Um, unfortunately, uh, we have an apology from Morgan Godfrey, um, who will be loved and known to many of you, senior lecturer, writer, and trade unionist, unionist and working journalist. Uh, he has a whānau emergency today, this evening. And, uh, but, you know, as 
if uh, May Day is anything, it is about family and about having time with your family. And that's what unions are in essence about. In fact, I can hear my two 16 year olds yammering in the background. So you'll have to, if there's any um, interference from my end, that's what that is. Um, we're very grateful that our speakers tonight have offered their time to share ways we can work for a more just future. The format for this evening, as with last time, is pretty simple. We will introduce, Jason will introduce each speaker. They'll speak for around 10 minutes and we'll encourage you to add your comments and questions in the chat. So we're, we're uh, going with Q&A towards the end, but um, do send those questions through. Um, our fabulous chat monitors will be compiling those and um, we'll also share links in a few days. And Morgan's hoping also to send through some bullet points um, because he, of course, has been thinking about this co-papa in the lead up to tonight. Um, finally, in the lead up to Budget 2022, which is due to be announced on the Thursday at 19th of May, and we will drop these into the chat later, um, we've also developed a series of demands around which this webinar series has been organised uh, because a just transition cannot be a slow trans transition. Um, try saying that word seven times in a row, rapidly. Um, we have a series of seven budget demands. Um, so with all of these things covered off, I'd like to now hand over to my friend and comrade, Jason Brook, to introduce our first speaker. Kia ora, kia koe, Jason. Uh, tēnā koutou everyone. Um, ko Jason Brook, tōku mimo. Um, I don't believe that we have Janice with us yet, so I may start with the book if that's okay. Not sure if we have Janice. So uh, hopefully that's okay with your book. I'll just give you a quick intro. Um, um, Brooke Paul Stanley is the current coordinator with um, Open Action Against Poverty, a voluntary political organization fighting for the rights of people. Um, also, just please note, if you have a part if you have questions, um, please put them in the chat and um, we'll get to these a bit later. So over to you, Brooke. Oh, thank you, Jason. Um, thank you to Rise Up for Climate for um, the invitation for me to be here tonight um, and for everyone here who's joined us on the Zoom. Um, so, yeah, I'm Brooke. Stanley Powell, Brooke Powell Stanley. Um, I work with an organization called Auckland Action Against Poverty. We're a political and voluntary organization that's campaigns for a poverty-free Aotearoa. Um, and a lot of our work is involved with campaigns, um, but also we um, advocate for people receiving benefits um, to ensure that they receive their full entitlements from um dodgy as wins um i think um some of the campaigns we've been working on since covid um are livable incomes so ensuring that benefits are lifted to livable levels um and universal services um because uh, historically our work's been in the welfare space to transform that space but when covid hit we kind of um we're thinking, well, even if benefits are raised to livable levels, um, corporations and landlords can still raise their rents, inflation will still rise. And so what are ways in which um, our government can support people to live um, thriving lives? What, what can they also do to ensure a just transition? Um, and so Universal Services looks at ensuring that people have um, access to what we deem are essential services. Um, to ensure that, yeah, people and families and communities can thrive. Um, and that's kind of, we've linked those two campaigns to Mati Kemai Aotearoa. So that's also recognizing that actually this system doesn't work for us. Um, doesn't, it doesn't work to include the communities that we work with actually. And that's been, um, what is it, intentional. And its design, um, poverty is a practice that was introduced here through colonization. And so I think COVID, um, while we acknowledge that it's been very, very hard for people, um, the pandemic and living through a virus and having to deal with 
um, these issues, we want to acknowledge that for Indigenous communities, not only here and across the world, across the world, but um, they've they've always lived in crisis, um, and so we think it's an opportunity this time for us to kind of um, move towards um, a system here or society here in Aotearoa that actually is um, founded on documents that, um, like Te Tiriti and Te Whakaputanga, to ensure that. Um, Papa Tuanuku is centered, that communities that we've excluded are also uplifted, um, and that everyone's kind of honored for, well, honored for their existence. Um, I think what Connor spoke to before in her, in her introduction about um, what is it, unionist and uh, climate activists and people kind of, um, being openly critical, our movements being critical of each other. And I think those things come down to really simple human things. Like to, to me, all of our issues come down to really simple human things actually. Um, and that's because we don't, uh, we don't know how to be in solidarity with each other's co-papa. I think we find that quite hard. I found that quite hard in the space that I've been working with. Um, I mean, people are kind of driven by what's best for them and themselves and they're not really looking out for other people or, or even how our co-papa are interconnected. Um, and they're actually the whole being united is actually a lot stronger and helps all of us collectively as opposed to trying to fight things on our own and within our own silos. So um, I think if, yeah, if we knew how to be in solidarity and, and in community and actually cared about what was going on um, and different co-papa or, or cared, cared about things that didn't necessarily directly impact us in our lives, but would so in, in other areas like indirectly impact us then, um, yeah, we would kind of be a lot more successful in the changes that we're fighting for. Um, I think also a lot of co-papa don't actually link their, um, link it to colonization, which I think is, um, a really important thing to do if, if anyone if you're fighting on the ground for any kind of change or transformation in Aotearoa then you should also link it to the dispossession and disconnection of indigenous of tangata whenua here um, that not only strengthens tangata whenua here it has like a ripple effect across the world so um, but yeah I think I think the things that kind of bring us together is that we care about changing this like transforming our communities. And I think that's a really important thing. It's just ensuring that um, we kind of agree that what's our bottom line, we're not gonna kind of, we're not gonna cross this or, you know, we're gonna be staunch about what it is we're fighting for and not, and, and um, kind of like, it's not at the expense of each other. It's not at the expense of each other's co-papa. It's kind of, yeah, I, I think we should be really staunch about those things. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's me. Thank you. Kia ora, Connor. Um, kia ora, uh, Brooke. Would you like me to just carry on with the next question? Yes, let's, let's go to Patty now. We're just, um, thanks, thanks, Brooke. And we've got lots to unpack out of that later on. Kilda. Okay. Shall I just, shall I just start? Yeah, you're welcome to, Patty. Yeah, I was just going to give you Thank you. No out. worries. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. Thank you, comrades. Um, yeah, thanks very much for the uh, opportunity to, to speak with you today. It's really great to be able to connect and share our perspectives and our learnings from struggle. I think it's really crucial um, for trying to meet the really terrible circumstances we find ourselves in with the climate crisis and trying to find ways out of it. Um, I live on Aboriginal land on um, it's Bidjigal country where I live. Uh, just actually about a kilometre and a half down uh, the hill from me, is Botany Bay or Kamei, um, as it's called by uh, local people here. And this is where the invasion of this continent started. Uh, Captain Cook 
sailed in here and shot some Bidjigal people as the first thing he did. Um, and everything in the whole area is named after Cook. It's just, you know, obscene, really. Um, I'm a non-Indigenous man. I, you know, descended mostly from Irish Catholic settlers who, who came out here in the 19th century and the early 20th century. Um, and I'm very lucky uh, to work under strong Indigenous leadership at an Indigenous research unit called Jambana at UTS, uh, where we're very committed to Indigenous sovereignty and to transformative research practice. So um, I do a lot of research, researching the history of social movements and researching contemporary uh, Indigenous policy um, and supporting communities uh, who, are, who are in struggle. Um, I'm also an activist. Um, do a lot of organizing of street demonstrations and protest movements. I'm in a socialist group called Solidarity, and that really shapes the perspective um, that I bring to, to my activism and to my, um, to my work. Um, so I just thought I'd just talk just at the start uh, a little bit about the uh, one particular group that we have here in Sydney. We were on the streets today with a big May Day demonstration of a good 10,000 people actually uh, rallying trade unionists um, on Gadigal land in Sydney today. And I was there with a contingent of a group Workers for Climate Action, uh, which is made up mostly of rank and file trade unionists, um, such as myself, uh, who have really taken it upon ourselves to campaign within the union movement for there to be a lot more organisation and solidarity with climate justice struggles. Um, and one particular thing uh, that we focused on uh, very strongly, sorry, just excuse me, my daughter's just here. One second. Yes, darling, I'm just speaking. Pardon? No, no darling, I just, just, I just need a little time. Um, yeah, so we have had a particular focus on um, trying to build trade union solidarity um, in, in, the, in the most recent period, a lot of our work's focused on trying to build trade union solidarity with Indigenous people who were refusing uh, to accept fossil fuel development on their lands. So uh, one particular struggle that we're right in the middle of at the moment is there's a major gas company, Santos, um, who are uh, Australia, one of Australia's leading companies, richest companies. They, you know, desecrate... Uh, lands right around the world uh, to produce gas and, and, and petroleum. Um, they currently have the Gomeroy people from the northwest of New South Wales in what we call the Native Title Tribunal, um, trying to override the very weak protections that actually exist for Indigenous people on this continent uh, through the system of Native Title. It's a Mickey Mouse form of recognition. Um, and this gives you an example of how uh, disempowered people are, a company such as Santos can actually go to the tribunal and say, look, we want to establish a big gas mining operation on the lands of uh, this, these people. Uh, they won't do a deal with us. So we're applying to the tribunal for you to actually extinguish their rights to allow us to go ahead with our project. And we will argue that it's in the national interest of Australia for us to be able to do this. And if they can substantiate this in the tribunal, then the tribunal will in fact extinguish the rights of the, um, of the indigenous group, in this case, the Gomeroy, uh, to, establish the, uh, to establish the mining operation. So it's a, a sick system. And, you know, Santos is set to get away with this. You know, they're in the tribunal at the moment. It's almost certain that the tribunal will, will rule against the Gomeroy. So our approach has been to try to build trade union solidarity and get commitments from trade unionists that they'll stand with the Gomeroy. And our ultimate aim is to get what we call in Australia a green ban. It's where trade unions refuse to actually work on a project because of the environmental uh, impact that that project will have. This has got some history in Australia. Um, and this is what we're working to today. Um, it's, it's, it's a long shot, I'd like to say. Uh, it's not the case that we have this pumping militant trade union movement uh, that's you know, about to go into this kind of a battle with gusto in the way that did exist actually in the 1970s in this country. There was quite an extensive uh, green bands movement that refused uh, to work on a whole lot of projects, uranium mines, um, uh, refused to knock down a whole lot of heritage housing and bushland and other things. 
Um, this is the history we're trying to revive in many ways, but we are making some progress. And, you know, in particular, we've had commitments from the electrical trades union who represent electricians that they will refuse to work on this project. And so Santos will not be able to have uh, unionized electricians. Um, so that just gives you some example of the work, but I just thought I'd maybe make a few, a few comments now, you know, maybe slightly more theoretical comments just to uh, show you, I guess, what's sort of behind this orientation um, and maybe goes a little bit to the heart of, of some of the discussion questions that you've posed for tonight. Um, and I think that that's, we need to look at the capitalist system that we live under, committed to growth at all costs, profit at all costs, um, you know, with huge uh, destruction of the ecosystem and exploitation of, of human beings, of labor in the process of, of um, capital accumulation, which they prioritize over everything else and which the entire system is set up to deliver uh, for the capitalist class. Um, that involves a process of alienation of workers, a uh, twofold process of alienation. Um, on the one hand, we're actually alienated from our labor. So we have no control over what we do with our creative capacities as human beings. We have to sell our labor power to a capitalist, in fact, in order to survive. So we sell our, our labor power, we're wage workers, and then the capitalist class direct where, what is produced and we have no control over the system of production and this is you know this is a horrible phenomenon <laughs> and you look at the mental illness crises that beset all major economies all around the world I think a lot of it's got to do with this alienation how, how divorced we are from that creative potential we have as human beings and the lack of control we have over what is actually produced you know with 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 our essence with our labor um, the second uh, major uh, alienation that we suffer is alienation from the natural world, uh, because in order to establish a situation where we have to sell ourselves to the capitalist class, historically, what has happened is human beings have been forcibly divorced from the land, uh, dispossessed from the land, um, and this has happened everywhere. Um, you know, this, this happened in Britain and it was the, the, the settlers that were created through this process that fueled the process of settler colonization around the world. And obviously it's absolutely crucial when we're working in a settler colonial context such as Australia or New Zealand, that we understand that the process of uh, dispossession and the alienation of human beings from the land in these contexts was an imperialist process, that it was racialized that it came with profound ideologies of racism to dehumanize the people who had cared for those lands for, in our case here in Australia, so many thousands of years, you know, about those deep connections that indigenous, you know, communities everywhere have actually had with their lands. Um, and I think that understanding that uh, twin, uh, uh, those twin injustices, the alienation from labor and alienation from the land, are crucial for understanding how we might go about actually constructing the kinds of coalitions and kinds of alliances that can take control again of the labor process. Because unless we can take control of how we actually interact with the natural world, uh, the world will be destroyed forever. We're seeing that with the climate crisis. Um, and I think, um, as I've mentioned before, some of the history of, of trade unionism in Australia, the most, the most powerful way that workers can actually try to take back control over the productive process is by organising collectively and refusing the work that the capitalist class tries to force us into by taking strike action, right? That's the, that, that is our power. You know, the only real power, I think, that is capable of meeting the extraordinary power that the capitalist class has, they control the parliaments, the courts, the police, the media, right? The only power that we have is our power to actually organise collectively and go on strike en masse and refuse um, to, to, to carry out, you know, the kinds of productive activity that they try to force us to do, right? And I think... The question of what does Indigenous sovereignty mean to me was posed in the um, was posed uh, it, it, leading into this discussion, and I think it's absolutely crucial for those of us who come from the process of settlement, colonial settlement, you know, to these lands. In many ways, part of the process of dispossession is we need to understand that there is no way we are going to be able to understand the lands that we now live on, value, cherish, 
you know, and look after the lands we live on without saying that Indigenous sovereignty must be respected because it's the knowledge that Indigenous people, you know, have, you know, of lands that they've looked after for so very, very long, you know, and looked after in a sustainable way. Those are the knowledges and those are the practices that we all need to actually fall behind if we're going to be able to restore some sort of balance and some sort of, um, you know, harmony with the, with the natural world. So I very much, you know, look to our, our world and we are trying to organise for and build and struggle for a world where if Indigenous people say that there is not to be the development, you know, um, on their lands, you know, uh, that, that, that is being proposed, that that is something that is actually respected by the organised working class. And we can use our power as organised workers to give life and breath to Indigenous sovereignty by actually taking leadership from and respecting, you know, the wishes of, uh, of, of people for the lands that they have cared for for so long. I think that's very, very crucial for overcoming the racism and the ideas of white superiority and other things that actually bind us to the system, hold us back from actually understanding our true interests, hold us back from being able to actually organise collectively, that racism needs to be fought and needs to be defeated. And crucial for doing that is sort of actually recognising the real true place that Indigenous people should have as custodians of the lands that have been so brutally stolen from them. So I think with our, um, with our uh, politics, we always try to centre workers' struggle and workers' power. We recognise that there's so many people that are working in fossil fuel industries that haven't chosen to do that. That's come out of the historical circumstances they've found themselves in, the communities that they've grown up in, the families they might have grown up in. That's how they make their livelihoods. We need to be clear that people are going to be looked after and that there's going to be proper work for everyone in building the world that we need. So we fight very hard for public investment in renewable energy and other industries that will be sustainable. And the other thing I think we need to centre is the question of Indigenous sovereignty and restoring uh, the, the, the um, central importance of Indigenous knowledges and Indigenous leadership for showing us the way towards a sustainable relationship um, with the lands that have been so brutally stolen through the process of colonisation. So I'll just leave my comments there. I'm sure there's plenty more to, to talk about. But um, yeah, it's, I don't want to paint some great picture that we've got <laughs> some utopian you know, sort of struggle happening over here in Australia along the lines I've mentioned. But I think there's very brief glimpses of possibility. And I think you know, throughout history, you can see those glimpses of possibility when workers have recognised the importance of actually standing for Aboriginal rights, when Aboriginal communities have recognised the power that can come from building solidarity with the organised working class. And we look to those moments you know, in history to show us what's possible and build for the future that we need, you know, to be able to have a livable planet. So thank you. I'll leave it there. Uh, Karpai, for that, um, Paddy, that was awesome, mate. Um, I've seen some of the work you've been doing and I was on a, a um, webinar where you gave us an intro to what uh, Grant was talking about, which is the uh, Green Bands actually, uh, the Green Movement in Australia actually coming out of the Union Movement, which is really, really interesting. Um, I believe we have uh, Janice with us now, which is great. So I'll just give Janice a wee intro and then we can uh, move on. Just a reminder to everyone, um, please put your part eyes in the, in the um, comments section and we'll get to them at the end. Okay, so here's an intro for Janice, Janice Panoho, uh, his uh, kai, kai hautu Māori at the PSA and she's of Ngāpui um, descent. Janice is a veteran Tino Rangatira campaigner. Um, at age just 14, Janice and fellow students from Auckland Seddon High School joined the Hikoi across the Harbour Bridge during the 1975 Maori Land Rights March, which went from the top of the north to, to Wellington, which was pretty awesome. Um, the following year, she took part in the Bastion Point occupation, this time as an organiser with the Greyland Youth Group. Um, an active uni un uh, unionist all her life, Janice began work with the PSA in 1984. She was previously on the executive board of the Clerical Workers Union. Excuse me, while I just move um, Clerical Workers Union and ran for parliament as a Manu Motahaki and Alliance candidate. During the 1980s, she co initiated a movement of Maori unionists whose purpose was to demand genuine treaty partnership and greater representation within union structures. Among other things, this led to the creation of Te Runanga or Ngā Tō Afina, a Māori network of over 8,000 PSA members. 
In early 2021, Janice was appointed as Kai Hautu Māori um, by the PSA, a role in which she oversees the integration of Kopapa Māori programs and strategies into the Public Service Association's campaigns. Works to normalise tikanga practice in the Public Service Association and leads the unions in engagement with iwi and kopapa Māori organisations. Um, I'll pass over to you, Janice. I'm not entirely sure if Janice, <laughs> we are doing this um, by the seat of our pants tonight. I'm not entirely sure. I've just spoken to Janice and she's definitely joining us. Um, but you might have introduced her um, while she's still making her way onto the Zoom. Um, so I'm going to do a little tap dance. Um, and I, I thought one of the questions that I would like to cover, um, and, and here comes, this might be Janice now, Winif Winifred's iPad. Let's just see. Oh, here we go, here we go. I, working for a union, I, I've also got opinions, but I'm facilitating. So I'm just going to wait for Janice um, to join us. Kia ora, Janice. I believe we've got you where you are here. We've just done a beautiful introduction of you. Where did you go? Here I am. Ah, kia ora. Ah. <laughs> kia ora, kia ora. Kia ora. Oh, um, kia ora, Jason. Yeah, I have been in touch with Jason before. Yeah, nice to see you. So uh, we just did that. Uh, we just introduced you with um, your life history in a, in a two minute uh, grab, Janice. But uh, perhaps you'd like to start by um, just a little bit of um, background about yourself and your journey. Yeah, I suppose um, I might start off with this um, Fakatoki from. Mm. Um, um, most people should know this one it's quite a, a famous one but I think it's quite representative of what you're talking about but uh, I'll start with Hute Tirito Hute Tirito Te Harikeke Kei Hia Te Kamako E Ko Ki Mai Ki Ahau Ki Aha Te Mea Nui he aha te mea nui o te ao. Māku e ki, ki atu, ki ta, he tangata, he tangata, he tangata. So if you remove the heart of the flax bush from where the bow bird sings, if you say to me what is the most important thing in the world, I will reply, it is the people, it is the people, it is the people. And that brings me to, in terms of um, where I'm from, so um, uh, ko Whatatiri, Rawa ko Puhanga, Tohoro Ngā Maunga, ko Wairua Rawa ko Punakitere Ngā Awa, ko Kaipara Rawa ko Hokianga, Whakapau, Karakia Ngā Moana, Ngā, uh, ko Ngā Tuki Matawauru o Takiwaka, ko Mangarongo Rawa ko Okorihi Ngā Marae, uh, ko te parafau, ko uh, te uri roroi rawa, ko nai te wake, uh, ko nga te ui oinungone, uh, nga hapu, ko nga te whātua rawa, ko nga pui nui tonu nga iwi, e ko Cyril Pānoho rawa, ko Mate Dalton o Kumatua, ko Janice Pānoho toku ingoa. Um, uh, tēnā rā koutou katoa, nā mihi ki a koutou, i ngā reo, i ngā mana, i ngā karanga maha, uh, i, ngā, i ngā mana uh, whenua, tēnā koutou, i ngā iwi, tēnā koutou, i ngā rangatira mā, tēnā koutou. Um, kia tai mai te aroha, nā mana ki tanga o te atua, i ngā mana tū, taonga, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Apa te hono tātou hono, te hunga mate ki te hunga mate, apa te hono tātou hono, uh, te hunga ora ki te hunga ora, ko tai mai mātou ki te tautoko kaupapa o tēnei wā. Uh, ko au um, kai hautu Māori o te pukinga hire tikanga mahi, nō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, kia ora everyone, thank you very much for the invite and um, Apologies for my lateness. Um, 
I didn't see the invite <laughs> until now. So um, anyway, it's lovely to be here. And um, uh, in terms of my journey, and um, you've heard a little bit about me, and uh, I've worked for the PSA for quite some time, 38 years. But during, you know, um, each decade that I've been with the PSA, we, we had our staff symposium. And I bought Joris de Bress. Um, I said, look, you could talk about the history uh, when I started with the PSA in the 80s. Um, it was a journey, journey for me. I was quite young and I had young children. Um, but there was a real uprising of awareness around the treaty, around the environment uh, for women, for in terms of the rights of, um, we had the Homosexual Law Reform Bill, we had the Springboks tour, we had Bastion Point, you name it. We had the anti-nuclear um, uh, David Longy, you know, uh, uh, decision to ban all nuclear ships coming into um, our harbours into New Zealand. So um, it was actually, it was probably the most amazing time in my life. Uh, there was so many things happening and you just couldn't help but get involved. Like it was about te reo Māori. It was about the environment. Uh, it was about our kids out at Mangere that we were trying to look after. Um, and uh, regarding sniffing glue, we went out to, and now we've got a purpose-built marae out there called Wātea marae. Um, you know, the struggles that we went through to make sure that they didn't build Odyssey, uh, I think it was Odyssey Health, um, um, Health Provider, which was for high end users, you know, that were on cocaine, but nobody was going to look after our kids that were sniffing glue and they were just scattered all around Māngere. Um, and we said we needed to bring our kids back into a safe area and provide services for those communities. So I, I think, you know, as a unionist, um, we didn't just say, well, we're in the union, we're only there to look after members. Introducing a Kaupapa Māori approach and actually looking at some of the treaty issues and also te ao Māori issues about the whenua and how we look after each other, it also meant us looking at what was happening to our rangatahi. Um, so there were, you know, I worked very closely with Sid Jackson also. Um, he was a, a close colleague of mine. And uh, uh, during that period, we said that, you know, that there was an opportunity. There were, um, there were low paid workers that didn't have any union representation and they were mainly Māori and Pacifica. Um, and we said that we would form a union to represent uh, these workers. Um, and the funny thing is, he was the he was the advocate because I was working for the PSA. But we, you know, people paid him in kind by bringing a sack of potato or some kai. It was um, it was the way we worked back then, you know, whatever we could do to support in terms of some of our, our people in employment, either um, through disputes or personal grievances they may have, Sid would represent them. It didn't matter if it was the most difficult case. Um, and so during the 80s, I learned a lot from working alongside Sid. I also learned a lot by working alongside some um, our regional um, our regional secretary, Joris de Bress. Um, and you know, they were people that I just I was in awe with in terms of their ability to just keep plugging at the system. They never gave up. And Joris is still working for migrant services and doing other things in the community he's basically retired but you never do retire I don't think uh, not in this job anyway uh, you just have to keep going but um, what I think for the union um, and this is going to be very new is about 
adopt, adopting Te Ao Māori approach. So Te Ao Māori is something that we had at our staff symposium and I bought a, it would have been great to bring in Patrick Tawake. Um, he's a good friend of mine and he works for corrections and he said you have to change the narrative around, you know, we are now um, for um, institutions like prisons. He said, we, we've had to change the narrative to we are in the business of care and management. We're not there to incarcerate people. We are there to ensure that we are not putting labels. And I actually found his corridor really well, uh, really interesting. And he, what he did reflect on is his upbringing um, and how he was brought up in a Māori world and how he was treated. And he said, you know, everything we did was we did it as a community. I went to school with my cousins in Pangaru. I don't know if any of you know where Pangaru is. It's right in the middle of nowhere. I went there because my husband's from Pangaru. And um, for the first time I went there, I thought right down in the valley, this is where Finna Cooper comes from, our famous um, queer who did the land march in 1975, which I was part of. I was only a young teenager back then. Um, but, um, and I, I really, I really wanted to march to Wellington. But he said, everybody knew each other. We were there about the care and protection of, in terms of our whenua. Um, if, if um, you, everybody knew each other's business, but you made sure that the whanau had kai and we all had to work the gardens and we all had to make sure, uh, you know, go down and get our watercress on the creek. And you imagine, and also our tuna, if we were going, uh, and if we were going out to the Moana fishing, those things are not the same for us anymore. I used to you know, I can remember being a child and going up to Waipu. My father always said, we're only getting a bucket of pippies. You know, that's all we did. We only got one bucket of pippies to take up to my grandmother's place. We stopped at Waipu. You, you won't find any pippies up there now. You know, if you do, you've got to know where to actually fish. Um, you've got to go around the corner, I think somebody said. But we used to just be able to walk out on the beach and go and get our kai. And if we don't look after our whenua and our rivers and our sea, we're not going to be able to. So a lot of, um, you know, our people relied on actually being self-sufficient and sustainable. We used everything, like even with our flax. I didn't do a lot of that. My, my grandmother did everything they used uh, there was a purpose for everything and um, you know the only thing I feel sad about is that I didn't learn some of those old ways that they had although I do remember my grandmother she took me down the back of the creek I says oh what are we doing and she says we're I was only a teenager and she says we're going to get Tuttle in the creek and I said but we're not Pacific Islanders because I was from the city and she said, this is from the old country. And I said, oh, what does that mean? Because she was born in the late 1800s, my grandmother. And uh, she only spoke to the Almaty. And my mother only spoke to the Almaty until they went to school. And they got told they had to speak Pākehā. And they, had to, they were told they had, their names would change. My mother's name was Mate. She hated her name. <laughs> she always said that. But they called her, nicknamed her Mott. And my Auntie Bella, her name was Pera. And they told her her name was Bella. And my Auntie Kitty, um, her name was Kitty, um, the Māori way of saying it. And I just thought I couldn't actually understand how that could happen to my mother's generation, and it did. Um, so if you're looking at 
what's important to us now, it's the revitalization of our culture, um, our real, our um, values in a te ao Māori world. Um, and I think we can do some really good things, you know, in the union movement to actually promote that. You know, te ao Māori, and uh, I'm talking with the commission at the moment, they're not going to go as far as putting the legislation back in my day in the 80s, we'd be picketing outside the commission saying what treaty and the legislation. And um, now it's, well, we want to, um, we're going to look at Te Ao Māori being included. You know, we're going to start those discussions. I think that's a really good start because there's some things that we can learn from our culture that is about sustainability and it is about looking after the environment. Um, but I'm, I'm not an expert in that world, but I only can tell you what I've, what I've seen over the, over the years that I've worked for the PSA, for the um, unions, and I suppose they're the most progressive. If you get the unions on board, they're the most progressive group, and we will make the change. We've done some amazing things. I'm recently working on Te Toipoto. It's closing the um, closing the gender pay gap for Māori Pacifica and ethnic minorities. And so we're writing up the guidance for the public service and also crown entities. And um, so back in 2018, we'd already done the launch of the gender pay um, action plan, and now we've um, now we've included looking at closing the ethnic pay gap because Māori is sitting around 8.3. Pacifica is really high, 17%. Um, the Asian um, ethnic group is around 11.3. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, yeah, so to order water, um, pay equity, that's something else that we um, have been, <coughs> sorry, I'm, I've got a tickle in my throat. Maybe I'll stop talking for a minute and I'll let somebody else do some talking and ask questions. Hold on, I'll just put my speaker on mute so I can. You have a break, Janice. It's nothing worse than trying to hold back a cough when um, when all it wants to do is is get out, especially if you're on a train. Um, maybe this is a good time for us to go to um, if one of our lovely tech team could spotlight Janice and Brooke and Patty and Jason and myself. I think that Zoom allows you to spotlight five people at once. Um, Kia ora, Janice. Um, and I had the um, pleasure of working with you for seven years as a PSA staff member myself. And it's so lovely to hear, you know, and all that time I didn't know as much of your story as I do now. And I, I, um, I, um, I, I honour the many years that you have put in to, uh, to the union movement, to the feminist movement, and that you keep keep putting in um I didn't realize you spent nearly 40 years at the PSA and that you were a Mana Motuhake candidate um mm. it's the reason I came back to Australia uh to New Zealand I never remember which country I'm in um was to volunteer for the alliance back in 1995 so um oh, wow. yeah we've got a common thread there um and I wanted to come on um to a question that uh, probably primarily for you um but um, maybe the other speakers will have a perspective as well. Um, so over at uh, my union, NZDI Te Reo Roa, um, I'm also working with members on climate. And one of the things uh, that um, I'm into, I've interviewed uh, members for my master's thesis about how our climate mahi aligns with our commitment to centre Tamariki Māori first in everything we do and, and what... Uh, members have said is we need a kaupapa Māori approach to climate change um, 
we need a you know we need a social justice approach that is grounded in Matauranga Māori. Oh. So we have a, a question from Sky that's along those lines. Um, Paddy was talking about people being alienated from the Fenua as part of the establishment of our colonial system over here, our current capitalist and colonial system. How can we encourage Pākehā who have no Indigenous whakapapa to engage um, given that there is no land here at least for them to reconnect with? That's a really good question actually. Um, I think, you know, I think there's been this um, view, there's Pākehā and there's Māori and neither of the two come together. And, um, but I've learned to live in both worlds. I've learned to, I have been assimilated into Pākehā culture um, more so than my Māori culture. So I'm learning how to speak te reo Māori now through the wānanga because all these years you go, you drop in and out of learning, oh, I'm going to go back to, you know, wānanga, but you have to be really dedicated and these jobs are so, so busy that yeah. if you're working in mainstream, you've got to make the time. So this year is my challenge. So I say to Pākehā, and even in the Wānanga, we've got a lot of Pākehā that are uh, part of our group studying. And also, because um, they'll go to Wānanga, we'll go to a marae setting. Coming along and being part of that and also finding out who your Māori community, it might be the local kura up the road, and going to introduce yourself, you know, like they'll have, they'll have a, um, you know, a fair day or something in Tafano Day where they'll have shops and things and, uh, you know, uh, gifts and all sorts of things that they have, that they sell, make. And I think being part of the community, actually getting to know your community Mm. It's the best way. And of course, friends of mine, they said, oh, we're learning how to speak to Del Māori. We've gone to the local kora. And they said, we've got classes. You know, and I said, great. Well, these are people that I did um, when I went to, um, I did dancing. So, you know, my mother loved tap dancing. She loved um, ballet and um, highland dancing. So we knew how, I knew how to be uh, a Pākehā. I knew how to do Highland dancing. I knew how to do Irish. I did all my exams and I passed with honours. Went to the most strictest teacher. But, you know, after I finished that, I didn't want to do it ever, ever again because I thought I don't want to be a dancer. Actually, I want to be a political activist. <laughs> That's when I was 15. <laughs> but um, it taught us how we could... I, I know how to live in a Pākehā world, but if I had to go to my peers and say, do you know how to live in a Māori world? And our, our Pākehā colleagues or our friends or whānau, only those that have married in, have learnt about our culture and who we are. Anyway, I'm making um, um, that, that, that's... Um, my view about in terms that if you truly want to engage with Māori, yes. start looking at how you can do that. Yeah. Get yeah. to know uh, Māori. And for our organisation, it's a long time coming, frankly. We should have been introducing this a long time ago in terms of things Māori, our kaupapa, te ao Māori. Um, I'm currently got our policy advisor drafting we're drafting up our treaty policy uh, for our union to ensure that we've got that uh, in place and then we'll take it to our delegate um, delegate congress this year in October um, which is a good thing uh, the last treaty policy was um, developed by Moana Jackson um, who was part of our in terms of our dōpū so if any of you get the journal, the PSA journal, we've got an article, two-page article about Moana and his life and the mahi he did for in the union movement. Hmm. 
Daughter Janice. Um, before we move on to the in, next question, um, do either of uh, you, Brooke or Patty, want to talk about how we can encourage Pākehā to um, engage on, on issues around um, Māori sovereignty and climate it, it, without that whakapapa? No. We're going to leave it with Janice. Any comments from you, Patty, in terms of the Australian situation? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think the, um, the thank you, you know, really wonderful hearing you speak, Janice. Thanks so much for, for sharing those insights. The, um, mm -hmm. the thing I guess that I'd like to say is I think the important thing as, you know, non-Indigenous people is like we need connection actually to the ecosystem and the natural world. It's part of being human. And actually, if we don't understand the ecology we're part of, it's that's why it is being destroyed like we, we don't understand it the control over how we interact with that natural world is 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 controlled by capitalism and it's done for profit um and but but we need to know about all the places that we live all the places where we get our food what their capacities are what their limits are you know that that's crucial if we're going to actually be able to have a sustainable relationship so connection is is necessary for everyone we just can't be presumptuous as non-Indigenous people that when we talk about having a connection, that's that's somehow analogous to, mm. like in my in my case, you know, Indigenous clans who may have looked after lands for tens of thousands of years. Like I can't pretend that I can have some kind of connection that can be analogous to that. Um, actually, I have to understand that if I'm going to have a connection to those places, I need to value and honour and lift up. Um, the, the Indigenous peoples who, who have had um, that relationship for so long. So, yeah, I think connection is essential. It's just important that we know our place um, within that uh, process. That, that would be my, my contribution, yeah. Thanks, Patty. Um, I've got a question for Brooke, but just before um, I ask you that, um, I think one of the things that we see is a divide between, um, you know, it's, it may be getting less so now because climate change is actually starting to bite, but for a long time there was a separation between, oh, we've lost Janice, um, separation between um, workers, work, uh, workers' issues, so-called workers' issues and climate issues. And um, I was particularly growing up in Australia and doing my degree in the early 90s, um, you know, it was jobs versus greenies. And, um, you know, it really struck me that, you know, as a young person then that you can't do that. You can't, oh, here we are, Janice is there. Um, you know, how do we get over that issue? And I think it's very real that um, climate is actually only something you can worry about if you've got enough time and money to actually worry about it. It's it's often seen quite rightly as a, a rich or a well-off person's issue. How can we deal with that? Because, you know, ironically, it impacts on the poor and the disenfranchised and the colonised more than anybody else. Who would like to speak to that? I can only reflect on my children who went to Newton Central, who um, it was a fabulous school in Greylun. And um, what happened there, they were teaching kids how to actually plant kai, you know, and then along the motorway, we've got, you know, the new motorway. So they started planting all the trees. And I just thought my son learnt so much from going to school because then he said, where's our garden back at home? So mum had to get at the back, <laughs> start digging up the garden because he brought all these buckets home. And I think it's back to basics. You know, like my grandparents had a farm. So we had, you know, there were, uh, we had rows and rows of kai. And I thought, why are we growing all this kai? Well, it was for preservatives. My, my husband, when I married him, he ate out of a tin. You know, he only had, you know, everything was out of a tin. Where he says, oh, I don't like those preservatives. They taste different. I said, well, that's because it's natural. It's organic. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's not in a can. So everything we had, the only thing we got from the shop probably was the flour oh, and sugar. Um, but everything was grown. 
you know, and we went down to the creek to get other kai. But so teaching our kids the basics again, but that's only if schools are going to be doing a program like that for our rangatahi, for our tamariki. I just thought it was great. And we were fortunate that we had that at Newton Central. But again, you know, middle class area, Grayland, you know, and I think there are areas and pockets within our communities we could do some really good work. Um, and even up north, we've got so much land up there. When I see all the gorse when I'm driving up, I go, that's Māori land. That's yeah. Māori land. You know, we know we know all the pockets of Māori land and they've got thousands of shareholders and nobody's doing anything on them because the way the legislation was written back then, it stopped us. Um, and now it's been fragmented so much trying to organise our people around some of the, the land issues that we have. But you can see that I think it's back to basics, looking at our tamariki, having a look at in terms of what we can do at home, starting from home. I'm looking at our own jobs about saying, why have we got petrol cars still? You know, within our own organisation. Um, you know, we do need to make the change now. We can't just wait. And unions should be leading the way. Kia ora, Janice. Brooke, I'm thinking about, you know, we're both in a campaign around livable incomes. Like, and one thing that strikes me, um, and you might have noticed this in Sydney, Patty, is um, like I can literally name a day when I was at a um, Greenpeace action in the morning and a livable incomes action in the afternoon and there was only me and one other person that overlapped and I, I worry about the separation of poverty the, the the discussion around social justice and um, climate as if they're two separate things and I, I think you know without keeping my facilitation hat on um but it's near, you know, that's that smacks to me of uh, the whole neoliberal agenda. Um, how can we reconcile the, the anti-poverty movements and the climate movement? Thoughts about that? Mm. I think if we're going to centre Papa Tuanuku, then we have to ensure that in that centering, that all of our communities are looked after. So I think livable incomes can provide us with space for a just transition. It means like Patty was talking to earlier about how um, we're kind of alienated from our labor. And so um, we kind of, in some ways, bound to the system and the work. But livable incomes actually gives us a choice in what we want to do with our own time and our own labor. And I don't think this system just alienates us from our labor. It actually alienates us from what Patty was talking to earlier as well as about our essence, actually, of who we are, like something that's our humanity in essence. And we're, we're big, all of us kind of a kind of like a Modi, our life essence. It, it kind of disconnects us from that. And that has connections to the whenua as well. And I think any year, if we're going to censor Papa Tuanuku, we have to look at what that means in terms of transforming all the different ways in which we've become disconnected from ourselves, each other and Papa Tuanuku. Um, starting with first, I think our ideas, eh? Like the ideas that we have about ourselves, each other, about Papa Tuanuku. I think if our everything kind of starts with the ideology that each of us and our belief systems and our values, kind of what we believe in our hearts and minds, um, how we re re how we prioritize these things in our lives, um, and what's what's really important. I think COVID was an opportunity for us to see like um, how important essential work is. And I think if we're going to have a just transition, then we should only be we should only be doing essential work. And a lot of essential work actually is isn't recognized by the system, like. Yeah looking after our children, caring for people who are unwell. Um, yeah, caring for people with like family members with um, disabilities or different abilities, like um, looking after Papa Tōruku. Work like this is, people just think it's kind of a given. Um, 
And so, yeah, in my mind, all of these things are connected and the work that we need to do is actually around reconnection and, and remembering actually like um, what's really important and actually who we are and, and how to like honor that um, and recognize that in each other. Um, Brooke, while, I've, while you're talking, um, someone has posted that um, Auckland Action Against Poverty does an amazing job in Tāmaki Makaurau. Um, for those of us outside of Auckland, um, do you know of other groups people can join or suggestions where to start if there are no uh, current organisations? Yeah, thank you. Um, there's a group, there's a one of a, like a sister group that's been set up in Porirua, if you're in down those ways, called Poverty Free Aotearoa. Um, there's Poverty Action in Waikato that also does amazing work. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, I mean, because we've been working online, you can get in touch with us. Um, but yeah, otherwise we're kind of, we're based in Tamaki, but kind of like in touch with work and income spaces um, all over Aotearoa so yeah thank yeah. you yeah I appreciate the acknowledgement of our work Kia ora. Um, I've got a question here from Catherine um, and any of you can um, answer this how can thank you Brooke how can I'm trying to fiddle with the chat how can the union movement best ensure a just transition for workers in the fertilizer. So this is specific, fertilizer and fossil fuel industries. Um, so whoever feels they can speak to that, um, fire away, possibly Paddy, I think, because mm -hmm. you've had a bit to do with the coal industry over there, eh? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is the um, really, this is the, the, the massive question basically facing the climate movement here because um, what conservative politicians have been able to do for a very long time is pose as the champions of fossil fuel workers and say that the climate movement wants to take away your jobs and destroy your livelihoods. And there's, you know, entire communities, lots of them, including really big regional towns in Australia where the entire towns have been built around fossil fuel extraction. So it's an existential threat to those communities to say that you're going to end uh, fossil fuel production. So it's something that's really plagued the climate movement here for many years. Um, and I, it would be great if the actual unions involved directly in that industry, in those industries, had led in a more transformative way um, the sort of debate around this, because I think that that's where the power is to be able to force um, a just transition. Um, uh, so, some have, uh, as I mentioned before, the electrical trades union here is very, very strong um, in opposing new fossil fuel developments and fighting hard for investment in renewable energy and transition for workers. The maritime union who represent workers in the offshore oil and gas industries have played a similar role. Um, but it's not across the board. Um, the, the key things that we've tried to do as Workers for Climate Action is to really push that the whole development of new industries, climate friendly industries, such as renewable energy or land rehabilitation and um, these sorts of things are um, publicly owned and, and that they're planned because if we have a market driven transition to renewable energy, um, it's chaotic. Uh, the new jobs that are created in the privatised renewable energy industry are not unionised. They're often a lot uh, paying rubbish wages way below what exists for the established uh, industries where there's been union struggle for generations to win, you know, particular kinds of conditions, you know, through the fossil fuel and mining industries, for example. So part of the big fight that we've had here is to say that it's not enough to say, oh, renewables are going to be cheaper. And so we're going to have all this private investment in renewables and that's going to be great because what you get is a transition that's not fast enough that's too chaotic and leaves the actual workers who are currently in the in the energy system as it's currently constituted leaves them behind it allows the companies to just throw them off on the scrap heap as they've thrown them on the scrap heap you know so many times before when a particular mine is not profitable so a really important thing i think for the climate movement as a whole is to not just talk in the abstract about oh we need renewable energy but to actually fight for 
proper planned investment in these new industries in a way that can allow for a transition for communities that are already in the energy system to be central to that, for people to have new job opportunities, uh, for communities to have new infrastructure, you know, as, as part of the process. So I think that that's a big part of it is to just center, you know, a workers rights politics and, you know, sort of be saying that we need, um, we need it to be planned. And, you know, I mean, all of the coal fired power stations in Australia were actually built by the state. They were state utilities um, in the 1960s and 70s and 80s. And then the wave of privatization and neoliberalism, they were all, all sold off. So it's not the case that it's, it's just the market which can build energy infrastructure. Actually, it should be planned and it should be done in a way that brings people along and provides opportunities for people. So that's one thing that we've seen as important is to have that at the front, you know, a just transition, public ownership and planning uh, through the transition. Thanks, Paddy. And I want to come back to um, probably uh, towards the end, if I can get you three to think about this question. But um, this will, and I'll, I'll prep you now. Um, what would a ticker? So a ticker is um, how would you say a correct and proper and appropriate just transition look like? What would what would your vision of a ticker? Because Maria Barge over here in Aotearoa, she she says that our our just transition needs to be ticker. So um, I'm going to wrap up in a little while by asking you what your vision of a, a ticker just transition would look like. Um, but first of all, I have a, a question from um, Jocelyn down in Ototahi Christchurch. Um, a, a statement and then a question. I have a sense that more people, particularly younger people, are more willing to embrace Indigenous perspectives. Mātou ranga Māori as, as, the, as the impacts of biodiversity loss and climate change are becoming more obvious. They look to connect with the whenua, wai, kitai, and learn about how they can tackle environmental issues in partnership. One thing I think they miss, though, is the power of collectivism in their workplace, as most young people know very little about unionism. How can we make the union movement and worker activism more relevant to young people's lives, particularly as they try to tackle climate change? And um, we would like to go first on that. I'll throw it over to soon as I see that mute come off. I'm happy to start. <laughs> I think we've got um, that uh, the PSA, the great thing we've done is uh, get a, we've got a youth network. So we have to take this out to our um, rangatahi. They are our future and you know, they're very, very organised. Um, you know, we've got such talented uh, young people coming through with the real, with in terms of um, who are, are part of the change, just change now, saying that it's no longer acceptable. You know, they can rally around. I think we used to do that in the 70s and the 80s, march down Queen Street, you know, with our banners about the treaty, um, but I've just seen them just all of a sudden just down there uh, to talk about climate change and, you know, and they're, they're vocal, they're organised. And I think um, any of our networks we need to use, I think the unions really need to take heed of this. But I think um, if you haven't got the rangatahi organised as a network within your organisation, your union, you need to because... Uh, they will move things along. And I think we've been able to educate them also about unionism. A lot of them just didn't have it. You know, you can imagine uh, during the 1990s where it was the Employment Contracts Act and, um, and everybody remembers that. Um, that was quite deliberate in terms of getting rid of unions completely. Um, but some of us survived uh, during that time. But there were a whole bunch of young people that had no understanding of unions and why would we you why do we need to join the union because it was about me I could negotiate uh, my own collective I don't need anyone to do that for me so really I think the tides changed I think we've got more young people involved in the union now but I think we can still um, do a lot more work in terms of encouraging um, 
uh, getting political activists involved. Yeah. Either of the other two. I, the observation that I'd make is that um, strikes build unions. You know, so when unions are actually taking action and out there fighting and showing people that we can win, uh, that's like certainly my experience at university is we have the biggest membership drive and people joining is when we're actually taking action. You know, so I think they go hand in hand. Like we've gone from a situation in Australia where we had, you know, 60% of the workforce in unions in the 1970s is down to like 11 or 12% now. And that correlates really directly with the drop in the level of struggle from trade unions as well. We've now got the lowest level of strikes in Australian history over the last few years as well. So um, that's starting to turn around, actually, even just in the last couple of months, there's been a lot more union agitation and people on the streets. Um, but I think that, yeah, I, I just am very much in favour of where unions exist and are strong, the more we can do to actually struggle and fight. Uh, the more we can show that we're relevant. But I also saw a comment in um, the chat about um, actually, and I think it's right, that unions taking up broader social issues and particularly the issue of climate change and Indigenous rights, I think is a really important way to grow as well. Like the, the biggest uh, demonstrations that we've had in Sydney over the last couple of years, well, before COVID, this was since the lockdowns, you know, it's been very hard. But um, there were, you know, we had 80,000 people out at the uh, student climate strike in September of 2019. Um, and uh, you know, I think a lot of trade unions uh, sort of supported that strike or went there. But, you know, certainly at uni, um, our union really got behind it. And people joined on that basis as well. You know, we were saying, like, as a union, we're going to be organising for this climate strike. And this is a really important way of showing, you know, that we can actually fight for the change. And there are a number of people in my workplace who joined out of that. So I just think the more we can do to struggle, the more we'll grow. And unions shouldn't be afraid of and actually should see as central to their own relevance and recruitment. Uh, to take up these issues such as the climate crisis. Kia ora, Paddy. Um, we at NZDI Teriyoroa have just started, um, I did a dry run of climate training for our members on uh, Wednesday and Thursday night this week. And um, we have members that work in the early childhood sector. And um, so we've got, we got to the point in the conversation where um, you know, it was about, well, what can you do in your workplace, you know, given that um, you're going to be affected in different ways, there's going to be extreme heat, um, there could be flooding, all kinds of things that will make it very difficult to be a worker and to work with tamariki. Um, and, you know, I think at their finest, unions cut right to the core because this early childhood worker said, Right, well, so my sector is 70% 70, 70 privatised and my employer is hell-bent on driving costs down. It's very hard for, how do I tackle that? And I think um, we are starting to see a join between industrial issues and climate issues because you, how do you fight, how do you uh, advocate for action on climate in your workplace in a privatised landscape? Um, so... That gave me a lot of hope. Um, but unions can't do it on their own. Um, and that's something that um, a lot of us have been saying for a long time. Um, we need those partnerships. And Brooke and um, Brooke's been working on a livable income campaign with about 70 other organisations. AAAP's been working with the PSA and NCDI. Um, do you want to say anything about the Liberal Incomes campaign and Fairer Futures, Brooke? I think we've got an announcement on Monday. Oh, you're on mute. You're on mute, Brooke. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, AAAP, um, along with other organisations, actually, um, are calling for livable incomes for all. So that's to ensure that benefits our social welfare system, actually, um, there's, that we transform that space to ensure that everybody um, has what they need in order to thrive. Um, we want to live in a society that's kind of poverty free. We don't believe that poverty should exist. Um, there's also 
I mean, poverty sits at the intersection of many of our issues, actually. Um, there's flow on effects and impacts from the consequences of people and communities living in poverty. Um, and I mean, it's fairly straightforward. We think that if um, the government should do the right thing, um, they've got a lot to answer for actually in this country. Um, and yeah, in our opinion, livable incomes is kind of the bare minimum. Um, we've been, us and um, a whole bunch of other organizations have been working together with the Fairer Future Coalition. Um, and we've got an announcement tomorrow morning actually about um, seven demands before the budget comes out in May. Um, that kind of, yeah, goes into more detail about um, yeah, what, what the campaign is. Um, but yeah, essentially it's, we don't believe that Aotearoa should, we don't believe poverty should exist actually, not just in Aotearoa, but actually across the world. There's enough for everyone. Um, yeah, and actually all we're doing, I think at the core of it is just asking people to share, asking governments to give back what they've taken, um, asking rich people to like, do they need 10 houses? Like people with so much money, do they need all that money? Like it's actually just, yeah. Um, actually all of, I know we campaign on a strategic, on a government level, but all of us kind of um, keep these ideas alive and uphold them, um, you know, by feeding into this idea that rich people, it's all goods to take so much while everyone else, like while so many of us have nothing. And I think we kind of have to shift this idea that if you've got more money, that means you have more power when actually in a sense, Everyone is equal in power and magic. It doesn't matter how much money you have um, or assets you own or those types of things. It's actually about your essence, what Patty was talking about before. And all of us have that. So, yeah. And and you can't put a money value on that, on that essence either. So. No. no. As soon as you put a money frame on it, you've killed it, I think. Yeah. Um, um, we haven't really, we, we're getting close to nine and um, it's been a, you know, a, a long night and but an awesome discussion and, you know, the words constitutional transformation are sitting there and uh, waiting to be voiced, I think, and we all um, uh, miss with, so miss Moana Jackson so much, um, particularly those who work closely with him. Um, but I, I think there's something in here about whether a Westminster system, a colonised system, will can ever actually um, address climate and address justice. And on that note, I want, I would love you to just say in a few words, um, what you, what would a ticker, ticker just transition look like, and how can we support each other? And then Janice, I might ask you to close for us if you wouldn't mind. Um, but I'll start with, um, so Patty, um, let's start with you over in Sydney a little bit earlier in the evening. Sure, yeah, I think it would look like work for everyone um, to carry out this massive transformation that we need. You know, we need to completely transform the way we relate to each other and relate to the natural world if we're going to survive. Um, it's absolute crisis point and crisis time. Uh, if we can't stop uh, carbon emissions now, um, yeah, we're all in very deep trouble. And the same is true of so many other destructive processes that are, you know, killing the biosphere and leading to mass extinction crises. So I think there needs to be a radical transformation. And that means, should mean opportunity, opportunity, you know, for people to live, to dream, to think, to plan, to create, to cooperate. Um, but we need to have a livable income through that. So solidarity and wonderful work, all the comrades that are fighting for a livable income, we absolutely, we need, you know, to be able to survive um, and, and live well uh, while we're making these changes. So I think that's really crucial. And also crucial, of course, is confronting the um, injustice of dispossession and properly valuing uh, the knowledges um, and the history uh, that Indigenous people have on these lands and, 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 and giving them the power uh, that they actually need um, to play a leading role um, in this transformation and that their sovereignty is, is, is valued and honoured um, in that process. So, yeah, that's, uh, you know, what we're, what we're fighting for. Kilda. 
over to Brooke and then I'll go to Janice. Yeah, I guess my vision is Matike Mai Aotearoa, which is constitutional transformation. That's um, ensuring that Aotearoa actually, on it, well, the Crown actually honours Te Siriti. I mean, we actually just go away. Um, I think um, also the vision, like I've seen like a comment from Manu Kedi on Facebook, this idea of like work. I think also rethinking what we believe is work. Um, I think looking after kids is work. I think healing is work. Mm. I think um, reconnection with ourselves and each other and Papa Tuanuku is work. I think resting is work. Um, I think we need to like just stop, eh? Like <laughs> my vision is that we kind of become, if we're going to center Papa Tuanuku, then we align with all her ways. Um, we align with her seasons. We align with Maramataka. And we follow what it is, um, how we live in connection with her. And that looks nothing like what we've grown, actually. Um, and just making sure that everyone's looked after while we move, because these, these changes are going to be huge. Like, um, and they're not going to be easy, eh? They require so much, all of us actually, to put in work on an individual level so that we can contribute to it on a, like, responsibly as a collective and I think um yeah but from like a government level we need constitutional transformation mm -hmm. Kilda. Kilda. Janice um some some words from you and then I'll thank the team and then I'll ask you to close Kilda. um yeah I think it's all of those things that Brooke mentioned but I think um uh, for me, um, co-governance and co-design is so important now. Um, using our uh, Te Ao Māori framework, um, our values, um, introducing that um, is essential for, I suppose we talk about equal opportunities. We just want a partnership, a true partnership that values in terms of what was written in the treaty. Um, and we've never been able to get that. And now we're saying it is time because we have methods um, from the past that we knew worked in terms of the environment, protecting the environment. We had, you know, we had rules that were ticker, the truth you know, and we use those and they helped us. But um, I think, yeah, for me, it's about, um, it's also about in terms of we've got an intergenerational duty to restore the, uh, the Modi, the life force, uh, back to the land and the water and um, to nurture the relationships between tangata whenua and also the whenua, the land. So, yeah, that's my parting anyway. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's been lovely to see all of you. And, um, you know, I, I was lucky to be at um, probably the last time I ever saw Moana Jackson was at the launch of Reimagining Decolon Reimagining Decolonization, I think it was called. And he talked about the ability to dream. And, Patty, you touched on dreaming in yours your um, courier all just then, Brooke, you talked about slowing down and, you know, you'd think, you'd think COVID would have taught us a little bit about that, but, um, but yeah, we still got a bit to learn and, and Janice co-governance has to be the way and we cannot wait any longer. Um, just before we close, I just want to thank our awesome tech team that are quietly trundling away behind the scenes, keeping us all online. Um, and thank all of you for coming along tonight for this really important kaupapa. It is central to so much, that connection between Indigenous sovereignty and union and climate justice movements and poverty. These are all connected and we, learnt, we ignore this at our peril. Um, thank you so much for coming. We could have kept going for so much longer, but if I may ask you to close for us, Janice, um, that would be awesome. 
Uh, kia ora, everyone. Uh, me, me karakia a uh, tato, uh, kia tau na manaki tanga, uh, te mea naro ki runga, ki tēnā, ki tēnā o tato, kia mahia te hua, mā kihi kihi, kia toi ki te kupu, toi te mana, toi te aroha, toi te reo Māori, kia tūturu, ka whakamaua, Kia tina, tina, huie, taiki. Taiki. Kia ora. Kia ora, po Marie. Thank you so much. Kia ora.